as we know, cholesterol is a very important biological molecule. For one thing, we use cholesterol as a component of the cell membrane because cholesterol modulates the fluidity of the cell membrane. In addition, specialized tissues of the body can use cholesterol to help synthesize other important biological molecules. For example, we can use cholesterol to synthesize steroid hormones, we can use cholesterol to synthesize bile acids, to synthesize vitamin D, and so forth. Now, what I want to focus on is how the cells of the body can actually synthesize cholesterol from scratch. Now, although cholesterol can be synthesized by essentially any tissue in the body, the majority of the cholesterol actually comes from the liver, the intestines, the adrenal cortex, and the reproductive organs such as the testes, the ovaries, and the placenta. Now, regardless of the tissue type that synthesizes cholesterol, cholesterol synthesis always occurs in the cytosol of the cell. Let's begin by talking about the ingredients that are required to actually synthesize cholesterol within the cytosol. So we have ingredients for cholesterol synthesis. And when we talk about these different reactions, keep these ingredients in mind. So we know cholesterol is a 27 carbon molecule. So that means we have to have a carbon source. And the carbon atoms basically come from the same molecule. It comes from acetate, which is the same thing as acetyl coenzyme A. And we'll see that shortly. So the carbon source come from, uh, comes from acetate. What about the energy source? So many of these reactions actually require energy. And so the energy comes from either one of two places. Sometimes it comes from the hydrolysis of phosphate bonds and ATP. Other times it comes from the hydrolysis of high energy thioester bonds in acetyl coenzyme A. And then we also need reducing power. Many of these reactions are oxidation reduction reactions. And so we need a source of electrons. And so the reducing power, the electrons, actually come from NADPH. And so we use the phosphate, uh, the pentose phosphate pathway in the cells to help synthesize NADPH. And this NADPH is important for synthesizing cholesterol. If we don't have any NADPH in the cell, we can't build any cholesterol. So three major ingredients. We need the carbon source, so we typically use acetate in the form of acetyl coenzyme A. The energy comes from the hydrolysis of either ATP or comes from uh, acetyl coenzyme A. And the reducing power comes from NADPH. So the electrons come from NADPH. So keep this in mind as we talk about all these different steps in cholesterol synthesis. Now, obviously, cholesterol synthesis is a very complicated process. We have many different individual reaction steps. And so here we're only going to focus on the important steps, the important reactions. The first step is you take two acetyl coenzyme A molecules and you combine them to form another molecule. So the enzyme that catalyzes this is thiolase. And remember, many of these enzymes are found in the cytosol and some of them are attached onto membranes. But all of this happens in the cytosol of the cell. So thiolase condenses two acetyl coenzyme A molecules. Each of them contain one, two carbon atoms. And so we form a molecule with four carbon atoms, acetoacetyl coenzyme A. Next, we have a different enzyme, HMG coenzyme A synthase that is present in the cytosol. It adds another acetyl coenzyme A onto this four carbon molecule to now form a six carbon molecule known as HMG coenzyme A. HMG coenzyme A stands for 3-hydroxyl 3-methyl glutaryl coenzyme A. And notice this is the same exact molecule that we use to help synthesize ketone bodies. So I'm going to stop for a moment and talk about HMG coenzyme A synthase. Within our liver cells, we actually have two different versions of HMG coenzyme A synthase. We have two isozymes. One version, one isozyme, is located in the cytoplasm of the cell. And this is the version that's responsible for building cholesterol, for building the HMG coenzyme A needed to build cholesterol. The other isozyme, the other, uh, the other version is located in the mitochondria. 
and the mitochondrial HMG coenzyme A synthase is important in synthesizing ketone bodies. So the cytosolid coenzyme A synthase, HMG coenzyme A synthase, is responsible for building cholesterol, but the mitochondrial HMG coenzyme A synthase is responsible for building ketone bodies. Now, once we build the 6-carbon HMG coenzyme A, the next step is an oxidation reduction reaction. And it's catalyzed by the, uh, the, uh, the rate-limiting enzyme HMG coenzyme A reductase. So HMG coenzyme A reductase is actually an enzyme that is present in the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. But the functional component, the functional domain of this reductase actually lies within the cytosol. And so this reaction still takes place in the cytosol even though this enzyme is embedded in the membrane of the ER. So this reductase uses the, redu uh, the reducing power of two NADPH molecules to form mevalonic acid. So we go from a six carbon to a six carbon molecule. And again, this is the rate limiting step. This is the step that is regulated by the cell. For example, if we have a lot of cholesterol within our cell, there's a negative feedback loop that decreases the activity of HMG coenzyme A reductase, thereby decreasing this step, thereby decreasing the amount of cholesterol we can synthesize. So again, the next step is the rate limiting step that is catalyzed by the enzyme HMG coenzyme A reductase. Although the enzyme is found in the membrane of the ER, its functional domain actually lies in the cytoplasm of the cell. So this reaction occurs in the cytoplasm as do all these other reactions in cholesterol synthesis. Now, this enzyme reduces, it uses the reducing power of two NADPH molecules to help synthesize mevalonic acid. Now, once we synthesize mevalonic acid, then we have a bunch of kinases that utilize two ATP molecules to attach to phosphate groups onto this carbon. So we attach one, two phosphate groups, so we, synthesize, uh, so we hydrolyze one, two ATP molecules. Now, we convert the mevalonic acid, a six carbon molecule, to a different six carbon molecule known as 5-pyrophosphate mevalonic acid. Now, the, the entire point of adding these two phosphate groups is we want to make this molecule into a very hydrophilic molecule. We want to be able to dissolve it in the cytoplasm of the cell. That's the entire point of adding these negatively charged phosphate groups to basically make it more water soluble. So in the next two steps, we have these kinases that hydrolyze ATPs to add two phosphate groups to that mevalonic acid, thus forming the 5-pyrophosphate mevalonic acid. The next step is a decarboxylation step. So we actually remove a carbon molecule, uh, um, a carbon atom in the form of carbon dioxide. And this also utilizes an ATP. So we transform the 5-pyrophosphate mevalonic acid into isopentanyl pyrophosphate, which is a 5-carbon molecule. And that makes sense because here we have 6 carbons, we utilize an ATP, we hydrolyze it, that removes carbon dioxide, so now we have a 5-carbon molecule, isopentyl PP, so IPP. So to form IPP, we need 1, 2, 3 carbon, uh, um, Sorry, one, two, three ATP molecules. So let's keep track of these ATP molecules. So, so far we've used three ATP molecules to form a single IP3, uh, a single IPP, isopentanyl pyrophosphate. Next, we have an enzyme known as isomerase, which basically converts it to a different isomer. So we form 3,3-dimethylallyl pyrophosphate, which also is DPP. So this is IPP and this is DPP. Now, once we form DPP, the next step is catalyzed by transferase enzyme, a different enzyme. And what this enzyme does is it takes an IPP molecule and it attaches it onto a DPP molecule. So we essentially want to combine these two molecules. 
Now, this molecule to form it requires three ATPs. To form this molecule also requires three ATPs. So if we combine these two molecules, so far we've used six ATP molecules. So we have six ATP molecules used so far. And now we form a 10 carbon molecule. Why? Well, because this is five carbons, this is five carbons. We combine them via this transferase reaction to form a geranyl pyrophosphate, a 10 carbon molecule. And notice we still have these phosphate groups and these phosphate groups are important because they keep these relatively hydrophobic molecules dissolved within a cytosol because these two phosphate groups have a lot of negative charge. Next, we have another transferase enzyme that adds yet another IPP molecule to this to form a 15 carbon intermediate known as farnesyl pyrophosphate. And so we need another IP3, so that, we, uh, so that means we need to use another three ATP molecules. So, so far we've used nine ATP molecules because we've combined an IPP, a DPP, and another IPP. And so we have this farnesyl pyrophosphate. And again, I'm going to emphasize that it carries these two phosphate groups, which gives it enough negative charge to keep it dissolved by itself in the cytosol. Now, once we form the farnesyl uh, pyrophosphate, the FPP, we have an enzyme known as squalene synthase. And what squalene synthase does is it takes two FPPs and it combines them. So if it takes nine ATPs to form one farnesyl, then we have to use nine more ATPs to form a, se uh, a second farnesyl pyrophosphate so that we can combine them via this reaction. And so now we've used nine times two, so we've used 18 ATPs. So it requires 18 ATPs to actually form squalene via the activity of this enzyme. So squalene synthase utilizes NADPH, that's where the reduction power comes into play, and now we remove all of those phosphate groups. So two phosphate groups came from one farnesyl pyrophosphate, the second, two py uh, the second two phosphate groups came from that second farnesyl pyrophosphate. And so now we form the squalene molecule that does not contain any phosphate groups, and that makes squalene very hydrophobic. In fact, it's so hydrophobic that it can't dissolve in the cytosol by itself, and so squalene actually requires an intracellular sterile carrier protein. In fact, all the molecules, or the, uh, all the intermediates from this molecule forward, actually require an intracellular carrier protein to remain dissolved within the cytoplasm. As opposed to here, we have these phosphate groups that help dissolve these molecules. Now, once we form squalene via the activity of squalene synthase, squalene is then converted to lanosterol. Lanosterol is a 30 carbon, so this is a 30 carbon because we multiply 15 by two, so 30 carbon, and then here we have another 30 carbon, but the, uh, but, the, uh, but the big difference is between this and this is that now here we have a bunch of uh, cyclic structures. Here we have no cyclic structures, but here we form cyclic structures via the activity of squalene monooxygenase. So squalene monooxygenase also uses the reducing power of NADPH, but it also uses the oxidizing power of oxygen. So we have to use a diatomic oxygen to help form those cyclic structures in lanosterol. So squalene synthase uses NADPH to combine two FPP molecules to form a 30 carbon molecule called squalene, but squalene has no cyclic structures, it has no rings. So now we use squalene monooxygenase, which utilizes NADPH and oxygen to help form those cyclic structures. And once we form the lanesterol, then we eventually convert it into cholesterol via a multi-step reaction that is catalyzed by many different types of enzymes. In fact, we have as many as 18 plus different enzymes which are utilized by the cell to convert lanesterol into cholesterol. 
So notice that lanesterol has 30 carbon atoms, but cholesterol eventually has 27 carbon atoms. And so in this process, we have to remove some of those carbon atoms. We also have to reduce some of those double bonds and we have to, um, place carbon, uh, uh, place the carbon double bonds in different locations and so forth. But ultimately we convert it into cholesterol. So we actually don't know the specifics of all of these reactions. And so that's why you probably don't have to know these reactions, but know that there are different types of enzymes involved in the conversion of lanesterol into cholesterol.